What is the meaning of this? Ned's eyes swept the room, searching for friendly faces. But his own men, they were few enough. Sir Raymond Dury guarded his look well. Lord Renly wore half a smile that might mean anything. And old Sir Barristan was grave. The rest were Lannister men and hostile. Hi everybody, welcome to another re-reading video and today we have a special guest. We have a special guest. Hello Theo. Hi girl. So happy to have you back, Theo. We did a bunch of videos about the Song of, of, Song of Us and Fire, Game of Thrones, Lord of the Rings. So we want to do a re-reading video. Eddard 3. Things really start to come to a head. They, the Game of Thrones starts being played in earnest. Cersei and Ned are at each other's throats and the nominal king doesn't know what to do. One side seems to be playing for keeps and you have this contrast of the philosophy towards power from Ned, uh, which is sort of honor first and the philosophy of power from the Lannisters, which is power at all costs, power first. So I'm looking forward to getting into this one. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So this is, in this chapter, this is like the mock trial for Arya after she attacked Joffrey in Nymeria, beat off his hand, and now the king has to make a decision what to do, what to do. What was the first thing that uh, got your attention when you were re-re-re-re-re-reading uh, this chapter because you've been teaching this book also uh, for quite some time? So th different things pop up different times I look at this. For whatever reason, when I read this time, I was looking at Robert and his relationship with his son, which is this weird kind of thing. It's so easy to root against Joffrey in this scene, but if you look at it like here's, you know, clearly Robert could kind of take or leave this kid. That's something that's been set, that's set in, in their relationship from way before this moment, right, in the story. And the fact that, he, that his son was emasculated and that his brother Renly was in the scene is piling on and making fun of him. Robert, you know, he's just not interested in being a father. Uh, never was, right? They never talk. They never talk. He let Cersei have this kid. Basically, you could say that you're describing a sense of alienation that Robert has towards his son, but maybe towards his own life, the way that he built it. You can also see Ned's alienation there, right? In the hall, looking for all the friendly faces, seeing he's alone. Also, the way that he writes it when he's walking, like the hall is silent. He walks into the hall and you hear the sound of his steps and you can just visualize it. Tick, 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 tick. Like he's all alone there. And he's used to being the final word, right? He's used to being in Winterfell where he's not subservient to anyone and his rule is law, his word is law. And now yeah, as he's, he's taken this, this role of subservience, where it's natural to be subservient for him to Robert, having an opponent like Cersei is nothing he has experience with. Like the opening lines. Okay, so it starts just like out the gate this way. They found her, my lords. Ned rose quickly. Our men or the Lannisters? She's not been harmed. Ah, thank the gods, Ned said. This is supposed to be one kingdom, okay, seven kingdoms, but one king. Our men are the Lannisters, so is it really one kingdom under one king? Just like uh, there's a lot of uh, room for maneuvering, and a vacuum of power in this uh, basic, uh, you know, pyramid of power. Absolutely. There's a king, but where does everyone else lie, right? Where does the king lie? Where does the queen lie in relationship to the hand of the king, right? Who has more power there? We remember those dogs from the from previous videos. <laughs> no, 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 it's my dog, it's my dog, it's my dog, it's my dog, it's my dog. And you were mentioning the king, so it's like chess, right? You gotta get the king, but she's better at it than him. Right. She's ruthless about it. Well, the queen, I mean, on the chessboard, if you're gonna, if you're gonna look at it that way, the, the queen is the most devastating piece and the most powerful piece, right? The room was crowded when he burst in. Too crowded, he thought. Left alone, he and Robert, Robert, not the king, might have been able to settle the matter amicably. Robert was slumped on the throne at the far end of the hall, all sad that he actually has to make decisions. Ah, this is actually not a quote, this is my note. 
Arya stood in the center of the room, alone, but for Jory Castle, every eye upon her. Arya, Ned clawed loudly. He went to her, his boots ringing on the stone floor. When she saw him, she cried out and began to sob. Ned went to one knee and took her in her arms. She was shaking. I'm sorry, she sobbed. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I know, he said. She felt so tiny in his arms, nothing but a scrawny little girl. It was hard to see how she had caused so much trouble. Are you hurt? Uh, I love it. I love it. She's such a troublemaker, but then you get to see the perspective that she's just a little girl and he's just a dad. Just a dad. And she was gone for four days. Just like, think about it. Four days. Four days surviving on berries in the woods. Wow. She's... She's awesome. She's awesome. And just like how he goes uh, to his knee and he hugs her, it's just like, so he's not a lord and she's not whatever future lady or anything of that sort. Just like a dad, just was worried about his daughter. So I thought that was beautiful. After Ned hugs Arya, he's like, why was I not told my daughter had been found? Ned demanded, his voice ringing. Why was she not brought to me at once? He spoke to Robert, but it was Cersei who answered. How dare you speak to your king in that manner? At that, the king stirred. Qua he straightened in his seat. I'm sorry, Ned. I never meant to frighten the girl. It seemed best to bring her here and get the business done quickly. And what business is that? Ned put ice in his voice. That's his first mistake. Putting ice in his voice right now. The queen stepped forward. You know full well, Stark. This girl of yours attacked my son. Her and her butcher's boy. That animal of hers tried to tear his arm off. So here the way they do it is just like, a, you know, a she said he lied kind of thing. But there, you know, like the male is accusing the female of, uh, of assault. Do we have to take his word as a survivor? Do we have to? Yeah. <laughs> it's fake news. And he's like crying. They all attacked me. They attacked me. This is the prince that was uh, bragging like the last chapter. How he's like Robert with the hammer. Ugh. Right. And here Mar Martin is just doing everything he can to make us hate Cersei and Joffrey. Right. They're just like everything you hate about toxic, spoiled, entitled, aristocratic uh, people, you know. That now it turns into bickering, so then like Robert loses his patience. He like roars and rises from his seat. Silence fell. I love that part. Basically, Ned needs Robert to be calm in order to make a sound decision that will favor him. And Cersei, she needs Robert to be angry, because if he's angry, then she might get her way. Uh, Prince Joffrey was pale as he began his very different version of events. When his son was done talking, the king rose heavily from his seat, looking like a man who wanted to be anywhere but here. What in all the seven hells am I supposed to make of this? He says one thing, she says another. I mean, it's interesting, right? His son, it's, it's his son who's talking about that he was assaulted or whatever. <laughs> I mean, he just doesn't want to be bothered, right? This, They don't even narrate joffrey's side of the story it's just encapsulated right he was pale as he began his different version of events when his son was done talking the king so it's like robert's not even listening he's like ah this kid when's he gonna shut up but he seems inclined to believe ned like he knows you know he knows what cersei is he knows what joffrey is and he's and he's done with them yeah he's not much of a father and you see the contrast with ned who's like you know, he's worried, he's anxious, he's, he's on his knees, and he's, he wants to run to his daughter, but he knows he has to, you know, uh, you know maintain his dignity in, in face of all these sort of dangerous competing interests in the court. And he has no doubt that she says that, that she's telling the truth. Of course, right? Of course, he knows his girl. So then Ned brings in, right, his star witness, Sansa, and she's, she's like... <laughs> I don't know, I don't know, I can't remember, I can't remember. Yeah, she flew at her sister like an arrow, knocking Sansa down to the ground, pummeling her. Liar, 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 liar! She ruins everything. And you know, like in trials, if the defendant acts out, then that's immediately like a point against them. Yeah, it's disqualifying, kind of. So then Cersei says, the girl is as wild and as filthy as that animal of hers, Robert. I want her punished. So first of all, 
This is how she's talking about a high-born lady, the daughter of her husband's best friend, to their face, wild and filthy. Yeah, as you said, she's playing for keeps. She's not playing games here. Yeah, well, I mean, I think it also speaks to how outside the gender role Arya is, right? And how that would read to the structure that she could get away with, some, to the social structure that she could get away with, that Cersei could get away with talking like that, right? You know, she would, uh, you gotta think they just found her, she would be... She would probably have a lot of sympathetic people in that audience with Arya looking the way she does, acting the way she does, and then assaulting Sansa, who is whatever the epitome of a young lady and how you're supposed to behave and comport yourself. Um, so, you know, Cersei is, she's seizing on chinks in the armor of the Starks. She's getting power anywhere she can. And again, she's trying to destabilize the situation because that's her, her best way forward. I want the dire wolf skin. That's very dramatic and very drastic. This is she sees an opportunity here to assert herself right. over Ned. And then you get the sense that like the game is over, right? Yeah. He says that like, there's no dire wolf, you run away. So Robert he he goes up. He goes up to walk, right? It's like, you know, you shoot a game winner and there's 0.4 seconds left and you're like celebrating. He gets doubled, Shaq all over. He gets away a fade away. He made No, you can still, illegally though, <laughs> win a game with that little time left, right? <laughs> I want the beast, the savager son. Before she mentioned the dire wolf, he was already walking away. And then the king stopped, turned back, frowned. I'd forgotten about that damned wolf. Oh, so now we're going to overtime. Now there's some uh, <laughs> new game to be played here. <laughs> It was at the buzzer, Cersei, nothing right. but Right, at the buzzer, come on. They get it to Fisher. He scores! Derek oh, Fisher scores at the buzzer! The themes of the book start to really percolate, right? So you got, you got these two contrasting approaches to not just power, but justice, right? Ned, who we, we meet right away as the man who passes the sentence, should swing the sword, right? that you take this this idea of wielding power over life and death very seriously it's a heavy burden that he takes on it's always a contrast with paid headsmen from king's landing right that they that they can just say hey you you go kill that person right which will obviously reverberate to the end of the book when cersei says we have the other wolf right right there that's like that's anathema to ned's philosophy right and that's saying I'm going to wield this power over life and death in this capricious way that I wield all power. Capricious like your dog? <laughs> I don't want to give you any ideas, but you know what Ned does to the dog later, right? It's, it's, like, it's like you've offended the goddess and now I demand a sacrifice, right? It's like it's very primal assertion of power. It's about offense and retribution, right? Justice is totally irrelevant. Um, this is purely about asserting power. Ned's, Ned is the one who cares about justice. Victory above everything. The other wolves did nothing. They have to lose something because we lost something. That's it. So let's go through how everything changed so quickly. And the queen raised her voice. A hundred golden dragons to the man who brings me its skin. A costly pelt, Robert grumbled. I want no part of this woman. You can damn well buy your furs with Lannister gold. I think all, I think his gold is also Lannister gold, but uh, whatever. <laughs> Queen regarded him coolly. I had not thought you so niggardly. The king I thought to wed would have laid the wolf skin across my bed before the sun went down. This is a low blow. But this is her tactic, right? Emasculating him is how she gets, it's, that's her one play that she's got, right? In front of everybody. He's the king. This is, uh, this is humiliating. You're right. So then Robert's face darkened with anger. That would be a fine trick without a wolf. We have a wolf, Cersei Lannister said. Her voice was quiet, but her green eyes shone with triumph. She's like, boom, it's in the bag. Please, Robert, for the love you bear for me, for the love you bore my sister, please. The king looked at them for a long moment, then turned his eyes on his wife. Damn you, Cersei, he said with loathing. So then just like that, Robert said, okay, Elin Payne, you go kill the other wolf. 
doesn't want to talk about it anymore, doesn't want to listen to the way what Ned has to say. Ned stood, gently disengaging himself from Sansa's grasp. All the weariness of the past four days had returned to him. Ned looked across the room at Robert, not the king, right? His old friend, mm. closer than any brother. And at the end he says, do it yourself then, Robert. He calls him Robert, doesn't say your grace. He doesn't even give him a chance to change his mind. What the fuck? That's stupid. With flat, dead eyes and left without a word, his footsteps heavy as lead. Silence filled the hall. He could have said right there, right? This was his moment. Look, Robert, if you want me to come with you and leave Winterfell and do all this bullshit, then I have to be in charge of my own family and life. And I'll turn the fuck around right now if you try to kill this wolf. Fuck you. Because this is foreshadowing for what's going to happen in King's Landing. Ay, 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 And then, before we get to Sansa, Ned said, right, I'll do it myself. She's of the North. But he doesn't want her to get, to get the skin. I mean, the symbolism is important, right? We know that these wolves represent something to the Stark children and that Sansa loses hers this early it tells us a lot about her character, right? And how she's been defanged, de uh before she even gets to King's Landing, right? And that plays itself out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's a very big taste of what's to come for Sansa. So, yeah, the symbolism is important. You can't have Cersei walking around with a pelt made out of lady, right? At the same time, uh, he's not, he, he's playing for appearances and honor, right? Doing it himself. So he's going to sacrifice his own emotional health. He's going to do the hard thing, right? Which is, an, it's admirable, it's noble. But again, you're sacrificing, right? You're somewhat complicit in this little takeover, right? You're letting this happen. You know, this is like a little foreshadowing. It's a little taste of what's to come in King's Landing for Ned. This is like the biggest injustice in the world, in her eyes. She's like, no, I didn't do anything. Lady didn't do anything. What the fuck is that? Is that, is that like a, it's like a biblical panic punishment, right? You said uh, you were talking about a goddess. So this is like a really capricious. But had she said something else, had she told the truth, Bad. I'm sure it would have uh, affected her relationship with Joffrey badly, but her wolf would have been alive. She's not carrying that? Yeah, I mean, this is, this is tough, right? I mean, it's really, it's really easy. It's so easy, especially reading this whole book in the, to, to hate Sansa. Right. First of all, one of the hard parts here is this, the feudal system where, you know, she's betrothed to Joffrey. I mean, she's not really a start, right? At, in, in this, in the way that like her loyalty is going to have to be to her husband. And so she's in a really horrible position in that moment. If she were to have betrayed Joffrey there, that wouldn't be a good look for her either. You know, she was in a lose-lose situation. And we as the reader, like, of course, we're Team Stark at this point. Um, but if you look at, like, the position that she's in, she's getting a raw deal all around. Like, she's thinking the long game, but she's not expert enough to know how to navigate. Like, she lost. But yeah, maybe she couldn't win anyways. I mean, she didn't throw Arya under the bus. She just said, I don't remember. I can't remember. Like, it's too much. It's just too much for her. Um, so I, I'm sympathetic. Right, 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 right. So she didn't come to her betrothed uh, defense. Yeah, it was Ned. Ned let this... Ned's the, Ned's the one that gets the blame here. Ned, Ned, Ned lost. Right. Uh, this is a very, very powerful chapter. I'm tired of uh, saying after every chapter that it might be my favorite uh, up to now, but this was very, very, very good, I thought. Just like I read it, five minutes, boom. This chapter, the whole thing is payoff, right? He's paying off a lot of dynamics that he's been setting up uh, throughout. So it's really satisfying to just read one. It's like just the whole thing's punchline, you know, it's all, it's just delivering dramatic uh, moments. Yeah, it's great. You know, I'm also now rereading a little bit uh, A Clash of Kings as I'm rereading uh, A Game of Thrones. And A Clash of Kings is way more set up than A Game of Thrones. Actually, if you go to every chapter, there is so something happens in every chapter. Here it's Lady getting killed. 
Last chapter, it was Joffrey getting mauled. Before that, it was uh, Bran almost uh, getting killed. John leaving, uh, leaving the castle. Almost every chapter, you know, Bran falls. Something dramatic happens, at least one thing. It's a really, a really good observation. You know, he's, um, he learned how to write was by being a TV writer, right? He wrote some big books and then he wrote for television. And what he took, what he takes into Game of Thrones is understanding the act break, right? When you write a screenplay for television, the act breaks are written into the scripts, right? So you got to have a cliffhanger uh, at that act break because you want the audience to come back from the uh, commercial break and whatnot. So he knows to deliver something um, at the end of each chapter in a way that's really satisfying and works so well when they, once they brought it to television because um, he was already narrating in that way. Right. Okay, so, Theo, that was awesome. That was awesome. Did you have a good time? Oh, absolutely. Fucking blast. Let's do it again. Let's do it again. Okay, so thank you, everybody, for watching. Thank you, guys. Hope you enjoyed it. And we'll see you all next time. Bye, everybody. Thank you, patrons, for supporting the channel.